Welcome to another amazing episode of Soul Chat. I am your host, Ebony Chitora, and I have the amazing Monica Wallace, and I share this every single episode. The pregame conversations that happen can always be recorded, but I know this is going to be so juicy. So let me tell you about Monica. Monica Patrice Wallace, M-E-D, brings nearly two decades of experience as a middle school guidance counselor to her current role as a mental health and wellness consultant. After an early retirement, she embarked on a profound personal healing journey, discovering firsthand the challenges many face and finding adequate resources. This transformative experience ignited her passion for creating accessible tools and guidance to support others on their own paths to healing. Through her consulting agency, engaging speaking engagements, and her heartfelt podcast, The First Mind, Monica shares stories of resilience and healing from individuals and practitioners across various modalities. Season one of The First Mind podcast is currently available with season two set to premiere in in February. Monica's work is driven by a deep commitment to making a meaningful impact, helping others navigate their journeys with compassion and hope, which if y'all listen to this podcast, that, that's what we do, okay? We are here for the conversations that go deeper than the surface. That's why it's called Soul Chat, because we could talk about, we could even talk about the psychological things and we could be very formal, right? And kind of go there. But today we're here to really hear your story. So I know I read your bio, but who are you? Who are you? What is your story and your words? So first, let me just say thank you for having me, Ebony. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think that you and I were drawn to each other and connected because um, we see each other. Mm-hmm. Like that's, you know, like we see, we really see each other. And so I love, um, I love that I'm in a place in my life where I am connecting with higher vibrational women and women who are like having, you know, conversations and curious about like, you know, our journeys and what's going on. So I'm so thankful to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you my story, but also just learning um, about you too. So I'm excited. Yes. Am I? Oh, that's such a layered, nuanced question for us as women. <laughs> it's like, so it's so funny. Um, I recently, this month turned 47. Um, yeah, like love, love, love um, my 40s. It, it has been very interesting and just a, a very edifying journey. But prior to probably... Um, I don't know, the last six years, I would have said I'm a mom, Mm. I'm a daughter, right? Like I, at that time was a school counselor and um, was very, you know, was rocking it out in that career, had a lot of success with that. Um, And now, Ebony, like I have not been asked that question in so long. I don't work in a traditional setting anymore. I'm not, I'm not in those kinds of spaces, but um, I really just, my answer is I'm me, like I'm Monica, like that I don't have any other, like, you know, like I am not attached to any kind of label or any kind of, like, even uh, as a mom, I have two daughters, two beautiful adult daughters, but even that relationship has shifted because they're adults now, right? So my mom hat is changed and is different. So I have for the last three years had this beautiful opportunity and space to learn the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Like I've been very intentional in figuring out who I am Mm -hmm. and what it is that Monica wants to do here for the rest of her days on this planet. So Mm -hmm. um, a part of probably what we'll talk about is the journey of getting there. Um, to a space where I can even answer your question. Like, you know, and so my answer to your question is that I am me. And yeah. I think that through our dialogue, you you and your listeners will see like what that means. Cause it's hard to put it into words, but um, yeah, I'm just- I'm I feel just- that though. You don't even have to like, I think, you know, <laughs> that's the important of your tribe. Cause I was going to go to say 
Um, even if you just want to say I am me, like that is sufficient. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Because we do, yeah. I laugh at bios all the time and I always read people's bio and then I go, what's your story? Who are you? You know, because my bio might change next month. You know, it might, it might yeah. change next year. Like, tomorrow. I, it could change exactly. tomorrow. Yeah. And it yeah. Does. If people really yeah. look at my page, my bio will be switching up when I'm like, I don't know if I really feel that anymore. Um, but I love your response because so many people, especially women who are 30, you know, maybe I would say like, I don't want to say 30s and older. I would say like 35 is kind of when women start to feel this or at least society places on us. You're getting old. Like once I had a kid at 36, you know, they're like, you know, you're, you know, I was, I think I was 35 actually. Who knows? It doesn't matter. You know, it was like your ovaries this. And it's like, I've been having kids with no issues. You're not going to place that on me or our sense of like growing old. And, you you know, honestly, just looking at you and I have family members who look amazing and they're in their late 50s. You look so amazing. And I always share with people like I think the founder. Oh, you went out. Can you hear me? Mm -mm. can you hear me now yeah, yes okay <laughs> um i was just saying i think the fountain of youth is um happiness and finding ourselves it is yeah it, it, that is the secret ingredient for sure and not doing stuff that you don't want to do yeah that's a huge part of it. Like releasing yourself from the obligation of doing things that you really don't want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I big... your... Go ahead. Say it again. I'm sorry. Finish your sentence. It's okay. I want to hear I you. I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. You can. Okay. Um, bear with this podcast, friends. Okay. <laughs> this is actually going to be an amazing episode. I feel like every episode adds to the next. Um, do you want to finish? I was saying finish what you were saying. Your sentence. Uh, yeah. I was just saying that. I think, yeah. Saying no. Learning good boundaries. Um, those are all, I would say, part of what is keeping me youthful and my curiosity. Like I just have such a, I ask a lot of questions. I'm very curious. I'm very, um, what I think this last decade has taught me is that I thought I knew a lot, but I don't know a lot. Like, you know what I mean? So like, I'm always just on this quest to learn more um, about myself, about others, about the human existence, about why we're here. And I think that kind of keeps me youthful too. Like, cause I'm just, my brain is constantly just like, I'm so interested. I'm like a little kid in a new space. Like what, I want to know, you know, I want to know what's going yeah. on. Like what do we do over here? Like, you know, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you do know. And it's all of that. You know, it's that that curiosity does keep us young. It's when we yeah. lose that childlike wonder, right? People, I always say God says be childlike, not childish. Two completely different things, right? Um, I can't hear Can you, you hear me? Yes. Okay, we're about to lose the mic in a second. Um, I was saying, you know, I think that childlike wonder is what keeps us young and God calls us to be childlike and not childish. Yes. And it is, it is, it is a huge, huge difference um, in how we live our lives. And I think that's what keeps us young. You know, when you feel like you don't relate to the youth, I think that's a huge problem when we've all been children. <laughs> yes. And I, crazy? yes. And I, the majority of my career was spent working with young people. So I worked as a middle school counselor. And it's that is interesting too, because middle school, that age frame of like 11 to 14-ish mm -hmm. was very, um, like that was a very transformative time in my own experience in life. So it just, you know, when you're on the other end of it and you're reflecting over all the things that have happened, it's like, oh my God, that makes sense that I would go and work with that mm -hmm. age group because that was an age where I was struggling. Yeah. So yeah, I worked almost two decades with young people. It's That's my favorite age to work with. Um, in fact, Ebony, 
I currently do consulting for an organization that the CEO is a student that I had in seventh grade. So yeah. like, it, it is crazy. Yeah. So I still have students who are adults now who are married, who are with, they have their own kids, like, and I still talk to them. Like they still, some have even come visit me in Dallas. So yeah, that was a, it, I love that career. People will often say like, oh yeah, I'm sure you quit education because the kids are so crazy. And I'm like, baby, it wasn't the kids. No, it was never the kids. Yeah. <laughs> you yes, know? you could forgive them. I could forgive kids who are childish. I cannot <laughs> forgive the adults, however. That's like, a hard it's a, it's a, Like education is a business. And yeah. it was, you know, for me, I was, I actually went back and worked at my alma mater. So I was working in the school district that I graduated from. Mm -hmm. I attended that district. It was 6% minority. When I went back, it was 30%. So in my mind, I'm going to go and I'm going to help black and brown kids. Right. And then you get in the system and you start to see like, this system is just not good for black and brown. Like I, like I need to like get my kids out of this system. Like this is, you know, healthy. Mm -hmm. So I think I, you know, did that work um, to the best of my ability for as long as I could. And then I realized that I can, I was like LeBron, I was like, I can take my gifts and talents and, you know, take this elsewhere where I could do more meaningful, I think work. And so consulting, consulting has actually, um, it has turned out to be something that was probably more, uh, of a self-care and service to me than I am even to it. Like I'm great at my job and I'm great at what I do. And um, I've just, I've grown tremendously with my consulting and I'm so grateful for that. But it really came into my life at a time where I needed work to be on the back burner. So hmm. I started this consulting business, but I legit for the last three years have probably worked eight to maybe 15 hours a month. Like hmm. I don't really work. <laughs> so the last three years, I have been able to just very intentionally focus entirely on myself. I do not have, like, I don't have pets. I don't even have real plants. Like, the only thing that I nurture right now is me, okay? Like, so, oh my God, that's children, the word. I moved, yeah, I moved to Dallas. My children are in Ohio. So, like, I truly have had the space time to just figure out, like, Monica. So, yeah. yeah been really good. Yeah. Oh my God. Thank you for sharing that. Because I think, you know, what I know is true is we always give people, um, an example of what's possible, right? You are, you, you create a new pathway of saying that this exists, you know, cause there's a lot of people who do hate their jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think it hurts the most I think it hurts the most when you feel like you're doing meaningful work. Cause I used to work in nonprofit and I feel like when that lack of fulfillment set in, whoa, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, why am I here? What am I doing? And that sense of joy and happiness I once ha had is really non-existent. So I would love to talk about like the early retirement. Cause I know there was some things that you had to obviously grow through and or acknowledge to really um, honor what was next for your path. So what did that look like? And what were some of the catalyst moments that drove you to be like, okay, this is not working for me? Because I'm sure it sounds like you loved what you did. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that is a lesson that is showing up even now in my life is, um, and I know we'll get into all this, but like, we have things that show up in our, in our existence that are nice, that are good but they're still just not aligned. I met, I went on a date last week with a man and he's very nice, very nice. We're just not aligned. You know what I mean? So I'm learning, like I can, I can love something, right? Like I can love my job and it's still just not aligned to where mm -hmm. I'm headed, you know? So my journey through early retirement is probably not what um, you would think. So I wasn't, I didn't like, get to a space where I was like fed up with my job and leave. I um, was living my life as a normal human being, as a mom, as a worker, like just living probably honestly, Ebony being led a lot by my unconscious wounds and like, not even like I was just surviving. Like I, I didn't even realize that I should be striving for happiness. Like, you know what I mean? Like I, like I'm a, 
Like I'm a mom, like I gotta, I gotta sacrifice. I gotta struggle. Like this should be a struggle. Like, you know, like, you know, yeah. or I knew like I could evaluate my quality of motherhood by how much of a struggle it was. Like there, there was definitely this feeling of like, life should be a struggle, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't even have any sort of like epiphany of this is not healthy or like I'm, you know, I'm I'm watching myself towards the end of my career, like lose my, like I'm like, I don't even look like myself, but none of that is even mattering to me because in my head, mm -hmm. this is just what life is. Like it gets hard and it's mundane and you're not really happy and you're not satisfied and you're not fulfilled, but like, that's just what life is. Like, you know, like there's these lows. And so what actually happened to me is my dad died. Mm -hmm. Like my dad died six years ago and my dad was my favorite human in the whole wide world. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> like my safe space, my, you know, this is a human who just poured into me, no judgment, like all my life made me feel like I was the most magical person on the planet. And so then he got a stomach ache and he was gone within two months. Like it happened really fast. And wow. whatever um, coping mechanisms that I had to survive what probably was really a high functioning depression and anxiety mm -hmm. dissipate. Like they, I like I lost my capacity to like cope. Like my dad, my, my favorite person died and I fell apart. Like, and I felt, and it was like, it was, you know, <laughs> it was like a crazy, um, yeah. I remember my students would be like, Miss Wallace, like, mm -hmm. you just keep talking about, you, you keep saying like your dad died, your dad died. Like, we don't know how to support, like how, and, and, and that for me was a meaningful moment because I'm here to support the kids, yeah, right? Like, girl, what you mean? <laughs> we love you so much. Like, how do we help you right now? You know? So then that's when oh, I'm like, I love okay. that. This is not probably, this is not healthy. Like this isn't, you know, this isn't healthy. And so I started to have some ideas. I always knew like from probably my early twenties, as soon as I like got out of my parents' house, I think that there was always a desire to leave my hometown. But then I had kids early. I had my first child when I was 19. Same. So like, there was something in my mind that made me feel like I needed to be close in close proximity to my family. So I never like left, but I think I always had a desire to leave. So mm -hmm. after my dad died, it just felt like, what am I doing? Like life is so unpredictable. Like here I am, like I'm, I'm trying to do it the way that everybody says you're supposed to do it. And I have this plan and I'm, you know, I'm like, saving and I'm trying to like make sure all the ducks are in the row and all these things and I think my dad dying and dying just so fast the way he did kind of like pulled the illusion of like this control this idea that I have some sort of control mm -hmm. over you know I can somehow ordain my steps in a way that are going to make it where the the path is going to just you know be so certain and yeah. my dad dying just taught me that that's not true like that that this is not true like you monica you could go fucking do whatever you want like you can do mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. and the path is going to meet you there like it just is yeah. what it is you know so i think um yeah my dad died and i was like crashing and burning i i was in a relationship at the time um that was abusive and i want to talk about like i want to you know, talk about domestic violence and kind of how that has changed and transformed in my life. Um, but that the last relationship, when my dad died, that relationship that I was in is the last relationship I've I've been in. Mm -hmm. So I've not been in another relationship for six years, which is um, interesting because prior to that, my first relationship, I was 13 and a half and we were together for four years. I've been in relationships my whole life. Mm -hmm. So like this is the first time that I'm like not in a relationship but my dad died, that relationship that I was in started to malfunction, for lack of a better word. We were in couples counseling with an amazing Black therapist, Black female therapist. And she kind of like, you know, through her therapy, I realized that this was not a man I was supposed to be with. 
But while I was realizing that and also grieving my dad, my mom also started to malfunction. Like it, like it was almost like these two relationships were like parallel, like they were like, I would talk to my boyfriend and he would say something. And then I would talk to my mom and she would say the same thing. And it was like this weird thing. Like, so eventually, you know, I'm no longer in couples counseling. I'm in individual counseling with the same therapist. I did a very specific um, trauma therapy called EMDR therapy. So it's eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. I highly recommend it. And the reason that I recommend EMDR therapy is because what I have come to realize, Ebony, is that a lot of my life, I was just kind of on autopilot. Like I was not in the passenger seat whatsoever. I was being led by my trauma and my wounds. And a lot of that trauma and wounding, I didn't even know I had because I was repressing it and just trying to survive, right? So EMDR is a therapy that the whole premise of it is to tap into those repressed um, and unconscious memories and cognitions and get them moved to the forefront of your brain so that you can actually process them. Yeah. Because when we go through a traumatic event, like to survive it, a lot of times we just bury it. Yeah. But the problem yeah. with that is trauma lives in the body. So even though, you know, we may not be conscious of it, or we're doing all this work to like bury it in our brain, it's still in our body. And so mm -hmm. as we are navigating, having different experiences, um, you know, we're triggered by, by different things. And it's because the trauma is still there. So I did this EMDR therapy. I did it off and on for two years. Um, the first year was just kind of like figuring out the mom stuff and the relationship stuff. And then I did like a year of that, took a break, decided that I was finally like, I think I want to leave Ohio. Like, I think I want to move away from my hometown so then I went back to therapy and did a year before I moved because I knew that moving and leaving my hometown was going to be triggering. So I wanted to make sure that I had some good um, therapy before I took that leap. And so that is what I did. That is how I left my job. I did not have a plan. I don't even know. Like, I don't I, I tell people, like, I don't give advice. So I'm not saying I recommend that you do it this way. Like, this is just what happened to me. And I want to say that because. I want you to understand that however you choose to change or transform your life is okay. Like there is no, I, I'm now at a place where I understand there is no recipe for that. Like really the only thing that I would say to do is to learn to trust yourself and your instincts and your intuition, because that is really what guided me through that process. So mm -hmm. I moved to Dallas. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have, like I, I'd had, I, I was literally sitting in, a, in an apartment. I did, I also, Ebony, chose to move to a place. Like I literally went on Google and looked up where are black people thriving economically and where are they not like being shot dead in the streets by the police every day. And like Dallas was on the list. So like, I didn't even, I don't have family in Dallas. I didn't have a friend group network in Dallas, but that was all strategic because I knew that what I needed at that time was I needed, a, I needed to create a, sanctuary for grieving because I was grieving my dad but I also needed to go on a journey to figure out who I was and part of that was not being tied to any prior relationships like not being like I needed to not I needed to go somewhere and not be my mother's daughter I needed yeah. to go somewhere and not be my children's mom like I needed to go somewhere and not be um a person who you know had been victimized by domestic violence like I needed to go somewhere and just start a new chapter like a real ass new chapter and so that is what I did and so I sat in that apartment probably three months into it a student called me who I had in seventh grade who graduated from Dartmouth got his PhD at UCLA like he's an amazing force he is the um he is the person behind your student loan debt being canceled like just an amazing human give us his number <laughs> and, I'll, I'll, and I will I will give you his information I started this, this nonprofit because he had this group of um a network of people who were all black and brown and they were in these higher ed academic institutions that were predominantly white and they had these passions and these projects that they wanted to do to help black and brown communities 
but they weren't able to do that work in the institutions where they were. So they came together, started this nonprofit so that they could do that um, that work on their own. And it just grew really fast. It's a multi-million dollar organization. He called me at the very beginning and was like, I need you to come do conflict resolution because we're all fighting with each other because they're all like super smart. Yeah. So I turned that offer down three times. Like I was like, I don't work with adults. Like I, my, I worked with kids. Like I don't even know. And like, they're like PhD professors. Like I have a master's degree. Like, I don't think I can, I don't have anything to offer you. And again, that is the early phase of this, you know, figuring out who I am and still being led by the wound of not being worthy enough. Right. Like, so I'm, turning down this opportunity. Finally, by the third time he asked me, I was like, Monica, he wouldn't keep asking you if he did not think you were capable of doing this work. Like, just take a chance. Like, just try it, you know? Like, see what happens. So I did, and I have been with them for over two years now. And Mm -hmm. it has, it just worked out. It worked out. Um, I'm amazing at my job. I learned that adults are really just bigger children like you know what I'm saying like so um, yeah the work is not really that different that I do um than what I had done you know for the majority of my career but it also again afforded me an opportunity because I I work remotely and I work about eight to 15 hours a month so I really just it gave me time that I didn't even know I needed like I didn't even know that I needed I I mean, I didn't even know you could work a job remotely for eight to five. Like, I I didn't, like, none of this, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, and and it's it's funny because there are many moments on this journey where even now it'll pop in my head, like, you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough because I'm still so conditioned for that hustle and that struggle and that it's got to be hard. And so I remind myself, no, Monica, like, this is also you know, you're, you're worthy of this. This is a, this is a type of work too. Resting is a work too. You know what I mean? So it is. Yeah. So that's how I retired early. I I did not have a plan. My dad died and like, I just fell apart. And I, and I, in that falling apart, I was like, God, you do it. Like, like I really like that was my thought process. Like I cannot do this life anymore. I had early on after my dad died, I was I was having suicidal thoughts. I had to go on medication. Like so, I truly was having a breakdown and was like, I cannot do this anymore. Like so, I need God, the universe, whoever's in charge, my dad, even like I need somebody else to come in and carry me like through this part because I don't I can't do it. So yeah, I just. I really feel like I floated through to here, (laughs) like, you know, so that's how it happened. Yeah. And that's, that's honestly alignment to me. I think to you, you said so many good things. So I really hope as an audience, y'all are taking some good notes (laughs) because you have literally been speaking to, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we we're always going to align with the messages we need and the messages we're in alignment with. And you've been, I, I, I should have probably been writing some, some points to like really circle back on, but I'm going to try to remember most of them which is the first thing, which is like you, you did have a catalyst moment. So the catalyst moment was your father passing away, right? And really losing that level of support. And there's so many people who can really resonate with that, who had supportive parents. And I've had friends who lost, one in particular lost her father and felt just like, was angry at him. Like, how could you leave me? Like, you were all I had, bro. Like, you're supposed to be here with me. Like, I needed more time. Um, but you know, really speaking to how it opened your eyes, yeah, really speaking to how it, uh, shifted your perspective and what you, what you thought you desired, what you thought you were doing right. And I think even specifically in America, and I think the outside world has also sold this American dream and it's so false. It's one of the worst dreams ever. It's a nightmare, because we are indoctrinated to check the boxes. We are indoctrinated that you get the good, you go to school, you get the good job, you know, you come out of this sense of struggle and poverty and you, you know, it's like everything to your point, you mentioned that where it's like, we don't realize that we really do try to control life and we try to make the right choices really in a way to be controlling, really in a way to think, well, eventually I'm going to get to that point where it's easy and everything just but what happens is you're actually so out of alignment with your true self that 
Um, it's so funny because this is a book that I teach from. I'm not sure if you've ever read it. Anatomy of the Spirit. Um, you would love it. Okay. Yeah. I would love it. So it's about the chakras and the seven stages of power and healing, which is the seven stages are each chakra and really understanding how our energetic, our energetic system is made up, how it affects, you know, different body parts, whether you're an overthinker, you get headaches a lot, whether, you know, a lot of women die of heart disease because they're actually heartbroken. Um, things that show up in the liver are related to, uh, your solar plexus and your confidence and things that have happened in that area. So anyways, as you were speaking, I literally just covered control yesterday mm -hmm. and how we think we can control things. And today we were talking about the solar plexus, which is your ability to trust yourself and know yourself. Because life really, there are moments where you think you know, and you think you've got it down packed, but because you've been living this check the box thing, you didn't really discover and explore the heart space, which is what about me? Like, what about the desires I have? What about the things that nourish my soul? Especially when we grow up in trauma, even down to drinking coffee is a traumatic choice. It raises your heart rate. It, is, it drains your body of the water. Like what it actually does to the body is traumatizing, right? But we are addicted to it. And I'm saying that because I haven't drank it for 20 something days. I'm, I'm like on three weeks now. <laughs> uh, good for you. And, and I don't think I'll ever go back, you know, because I feel like being on this detox, it showed me that a lot of the choices we make, even down to the foods we eat, we think our body likes it, but we're not really tuned in enough to really, really know until you start taking things away. And then you add something in and your body's like, because it hasn't had it, it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, um, but you spoke to so much to even I think sometimes women and men, but I, you know, we speak, I speak to women, which is you know, we become very afraid of that unknown and the exploration of self, right? In the exploration of developing boundaries and the exploration of, well, who am I really? Because it's scary. It's scary to almost wake up because the first realization is I don't know who I am. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm yes. Um, and it's a it's a it it's a hard and confusing like so. In my early um, therapy sessions, what really was coming out is like this understanding that my childhood was not what I thought it was. So like to, and I'm 40, like I'm 40 years old, you know, and I'm in therapy and I'm learning like that my childhood wasn't what I had thought it was. Yeah. So like it almost, it's like this, it, it became for me this point in time where it felt like. I don't even know who I am. Like, I, like I truly, like who am, like it was so weird, like to, like, you know, to like yeah. be on the planet for 40 years and think that you are this person and then go to therapy and like learn, like none of that is yeah. true. Like yeah. none of, like none of this is true. Like you, yeah. you literally, I, and I, I try to be careful about saying you and just say I, like use I statements, but like I was, I was a product of coping mechanisms, right? I was a I was I was a person who had learned how to navigate my environment through manipulation, through um I'm you know, I was very codependent. So the thing that I love I love talking about codependency because number one, our society is so like we're so conditioned to be codependent. It's so funny. I went home recently over the summer we had a family reunion and like everybody in my family is just like what are you doing like you're so you're glowing like what is like what's happening and so you yeah. know they're, they're all and and I'm explaining my life and I had my one cousin um who's a guy and I was like yeah like I don't I'm not I haven't dated in six years like I'm just like living my life and he I'm like I'm so happy and he's like you're happy and you don't have a man like he couldn't, like he couldn't understand. Like he was like, well, wild. <laughs> like it's wild for them to even say that. Honestly, the shock factor of that statement is like clutching my pearls. What did you just say? Like what? And so he just couldn't believe it. Like he was like, how are you, how did you find happiness and you don't have a partner? Like that doesn't, and you know, it is, it's funny to hear that, like, obviously from a man as a woman, because so many of us are struggling in our dating experiences, but 
that's not just him. My mom is a person who truly believes like if you just find a, another human to attach yourself to, then all your problems will go away. Like you won't have depression. You won't have anxiety. Like yeah, just get it. another human and attach yourself to them and all everything will be beautiful. It disappears. <laughs> Folks, so, it yeah. actually amplifies. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so I was so, you know, conditioned for like um, this codependency from a very young age. I remember like being so preoccupied with like, you know, I'm going to get a boyfriend and I'm going to, I'm going to be in love and like, the you one. know, like, from a very <laughs> young age, you yeah. know? So, um, yeah. So then what, you know, I learned and I, I have a difficult mom. We'll just say it that way. Okay. So I have a hard mom and my mom is a human who just, you know, has a lot of requirements to earn her love and you got to go through a lot of hoops and a lot of, you know, like it's a lot of work to be worthy of her validation and her mm -hmm. love. And so as a child, I was conditioned to love that way. Mm -hmm. So what I learned on the journey is that a lot of times we are seeking a romantic partner who mirrors the relationship that we had with the parent we had the most dysfunction with. Absolutely. And so that's important because a lot of times we'll, we'll think like, oh, you know, cause I had a great dad. Right. So it's hard. Sometimes people are like, well, if you had a great dad, then why aren't you meeting, you know, men who are like your dad? And in my mind this whole time, I thought I was dating men who were like my dad. Mm -hmm. But the truth is I was dating men who were like my mom. Mm -hmm. Because in my romantic partnerships, I was still trying to process and work through all this childhood stuff mm -hmm. with this romantic partner. And my brain is also been conditioned that you have to work hard for love. Like you got to chase this person all around town. You got to like, you know what I'm saying? Like you got to abandon yourself and your own needs and everything like in order to get love like that's what I was conditioned for and I think that's important because it's important it was important an important part of my journey to figure that out because there's a lot of shame in this journey right mm -hmm. and I think the shame comes from my at least not understanding that a lot of this is just brain function a mm -hmm. lot of this is just conditioning a lot of this is just your body is trying to survive in this environment that it's in, it doesn't have anything to do. Like I'm not actively making choices. Most of the time mm -hmm. I am just literally being led by whatever, you know what I'm saying? My current level of consciousness is. So mm -hmm. I was led to men who I had to work hard to get love from, who didn't validate me, who put me down, who um, were not nice or kind. And that is, you know, my mom loves me. Right. And these men probably loved me too. But the way that the attachment was, and not just, because it's easy as a person who struggles with codependency to put yourself kind of like on this pedestal of like, I'm the good one and these other people are the bad ones. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of um, manipulation that comes through codependency. There's a lot of like, I'm going to sacrifice myself so that you can love me. Yeah. And that's manipulation. Like that's not like that. And I'm going to show up in a way that seems like the way you want me to show up as opposed to showing up as my authentic self. Right. That's manipulating somebody. So yeah. I had to really kind of, because it's easy for me to, you know, reflect on my journey and be like, all these men did me so wrong, but I participated in this dance, you know, too. Mm -hmm. I was a part of it too. So that's been a huge lesson for me. Um, is just learning, like go, there are some, you know, practitioners and healers who will say like, oh, you don't need to go back to your childhood. And I've, I've been hearing that. And I, I can only speak to my experience and my journey. And for me personally, going back and unpacking my childhood, which I'm still doing, like it's been six years that I've been intentionally focused on healing. I'm still learning about things will still come up from my childhood that I don't remember or know, or mm -hmm. I'm conscious of. So for me, going back and unpacking my childhood was such a huge part of me figuring out who I am. Mm -hmm. And so, Ebony, a lot of times I remember in that early part of the journey, the message that you that I would get a lot is, well, you just have to love yourself. Like, if you just love yourself, 
then everything will be fine. Like, love yourself. Just love. And I would be like, well, I don't even know what that, like, I do think I love myself. You know, like, I felt like I, I mean, I get up, I take a shower, I put on makeup, like, I got cute clothes. Like, I I am loving myself. Like, what, I don't know what, what do you mean, but it's deeper than loving yourself. Like, a big part of loving yourself is knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you've been, you know, led a lot by your unconscious wounding and you don't even, you you don't have the, the capacity to go back and figure out like why things happened the way they did in your childhood or things that, you know, might've been traumatizing. Um, you're not really connecting with yourself. And if you're not connecting with yourself, you don't know yourself. And if you don't know yourself, you really can't love yourself. You know what I mean? Like, so, um, yeah. So, yeah. That's it's so much to unpack, you know, and I think, you know, I want, anyone who's listening to know, um, you know, it's just like healing an actual wound, right? Yes. yes. Sometimes it kind of gets worse before it gets better, or it still hurts, or it's still throbbing um, before the pain subsides. And obviously, you got to take care of it, you got to tend to it, you got to nurture yourself. Um, and self love is, is so multifold. And I, and I love that we're even having this conversation, because on the last podcast, we literally just talked about self love being like the saving grace you know, because it, it's not just the external things and like what we wear and the makeup and all the things and how we take care of our external self, but going deeper. And I am a huge advocate for the inner child. Mm -hmm. I like, I just, I knew about that since I was 13 and I prayed so hard because I really couldn't cope with life at that age. Like I just, I didn't, I really was like having a hard time with the human experience and having the parents that I had. And I was such a good kid. And, and I really was, I was a great kid. I didn't get in trouble. My brothers were like, even down to my little brother, they were all getting in trouble. They would talk crazy to my mother. And I was still kind of like on that straight and narrow, just very well behaved and getting good grades. And um, I remember praying for wisdom and God shared with me that, uh, you know, it was the childhood that was making my parents parent the way that they parented. And it gave me a lot of grace for them. And it kind of loosened uh, like some of that feeling of depression and different things that I have, but I'm always an advocate of the inner child. And there's experiences that we do forget. There's things that we really do forget and we bury it because we have to do that to protect ourselves as adults, to feel like, I call it like the adult ego. I'm not sure if it's a medical terminology, but I think as adults, we become very egotistical in our adulthood to where we feel like I pay bills, I do this, like I don't need to revisit that stuff. But if it still brings pain, when you think about it or talk about it, that means a portion of your spirit is over there, right? Yeah. I, think, I think wholeness to me is presence because that's what everyone suffers with is like, I can't be present. I can't just be here. And I'm like in the future. And I'm like, but nobody wants to acknowledge that there are, there are lots of things that have happened in our childhood. And sometimes they're not, you know, what it may not at surface look traumatic, but it could be extremely traumatic to how you thought as a child, right? It, as a child, if you felt violated or betrayed or unseen or whatever, you know, it, my, one of mine was like my mom not coming to a concert and me walking to that concert by myself, performing, not seeing in the audience, right? And at surface level, it might feel like, okay, that's kind of traumatic, but it's like, what did that, if that's a memory that keeps coming up, then it's solidifying that there's something there. There was something subconsciously that was developed that was like, you're not enough and you're not this. I want to really tackle your um, tackle is such a funny word to use for this. <laughs> I really want to dive just quickly and we don't have to spend too much time, but I do want to honor that October is domestic violence awareness month. So thank you for bringing that up for me um, to really honor these experiences, even as like in domestic violence that shape who we are. What did that? I'm going to be a little in your business right now. Um, but what did that experience look like for you? Because sometimes it's all emotional. Sometimes it's verbal. Sometimes it's verbal and emotional. Sometimes it's physical. What did that look like for you? And how did that impact how you saw like yourself and how you navigated the world? Yeah, good question. Um, and I, I honestly was thinking about this as I was preparing for the podcast this morning um, because this, I have not talked about um, 
I had one relationship in my lifetime that was physically abusive, but honestly, Ebony, I would say that every relationship I've been in has been unhealthy. Yeah. So I want to take it back to the my first experience with physical abuse, because I think it's just so interesting and telling. So mm -hmm. as you're talking about the ego, one of the things that um, the ego does, right, is it creates this separatism, right? So like, you know, not only, you know, am I protecting myself from probably the trauma and the childhood and all these things that happened to me, but I'm also like, I'm judgy, right? When my, when I'm in that space of being unhealed and not knowing who I am, I have less compassion for other people because I'm not even giving myself any compassion or space to like figure out like, you know, who I am and what I'm about. So I'm very judgy. Like I remember, um, I was in my, I was 25 and I was in my graduate school program. I was working, uh, I was managing a gas station on third shift. Like I, I was working at night. I had a, I was a single mom. I had a daughter. I was working at night. I was going to school during the day. Like, and I was like, I am the, like, yeah, this life is a struggle, but like, I am like doing it. Like I am doing the things, right? Like I am the, like, and yeah. I had, and I had <laughs> created a, a circle of women friends who we all were single moms and we all were trying to figure it out. But I think subconsciously they were women who were struggling a little bit more than me. Like, so then I also got to set, sit on this pedestal of like, Oh my God, like I'm, I'm, I also have to help my friends because they're struggling so bad, like with their relationships and these poor girls, like, Oh my God, learn your worth girl. You need to learn your worth. Like I know my, like, you know, like, so it's all this ego. <laughs> I've been there, girl. I've been there. You good. Life will humble us. Okay. <laughs> so there's all this ego. So then, girl, this man walks into this gas station on third shift and he um very attracted, very I knew, it. I knew he was fine, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> so yeah, so we um get into this relationship, and there is probably just a myriad of red flags. Like and I'm, you know, one of the things that I am conscious of now in terms of my attachment, like I have an anxious attachment. I'm aware of that now. Yeah. But I think that um, I am conscious of how I will literally, like I will meet a man, right? And he will not fit. He will not be aligned to me. But I, my imagination is amazing. So like, I will like make him fit. Like I will like, I will start to give him qualities that he don't even have. Like, I'll be like, oh my God, like, but he does, you know, and then, and then I'll make it cosmic. Like, I'll be like, well, his dad died. And then my dad died. And like, oh my God, we must be meant to be together because our dad right. died. Like, it's like all this crazy <laughs> shit that don't have nothing to do with. <laughs> he's, oh my God, he's a, I don't know, Aquarius, I'm a Libra. Like, it must be written in the so like, <laughs> stars. Like, I will make it try, because I was so needy for love that I would just try to make things fit even yeah. when they didn't fit. So I met this man and it started out, um, he, I, I knew that he, he had had an abusive father. I had met his mom. You could tell that this woman had been a victim of, like you could just tell like she had low self-esteem, low self-worth. So there was like all these like remnants of like abuse, right? Like in his aura. Mm -hmm. and um he was very controlling like he just we would be out and he I would be accused of like liking his friends like I would be like just so many things like if we were driving I remember specifically like in the car if we were driving and I'm in the passenger he's driving and I look to the like out the window immediately like I'm looking at another man like it would like it, there would be these accusations and so mm -hmm. It was difficult, like, if I wanted to go out with friends, like, then, you know, you must be, you're going to go meet a man. Like, there was just all this control before it became physical. And I, and I really want to drive this point home, okay? Mm -hmm. I was in grad school learning psychology, right? So I had textbooks and I was like, oh my God, like, I'm diagnosing him and I'm like, I'm going to fix him. Like, I'm this is going to be my first, like, I'm going to fix this man. I'm going to fix him and I'm going to make him the man for me, right? Like, because he just needs love. Like, he probably got abused and like, he just needs some love. 
Of course. Just a little bit. <laughs> and some shock therapy, okay? <laughs> and so I want to say that because I think there is this, this misconception that women who are victims of abuse are not smart. Right, for sure. They're not confident that they don't, you know, they are just women who you can walk all over. Yeah. And that was not who I was. Like that was not, like I had, an, I had a father who poured into me. Like I very much was confident. I tell women all the time, I've always had very good self-esteem. I had low self-worth. There's yeah. a difference. Self-esteem is based on things that you do in the world well. So like I was a good yeah. student. I was class president. I was homecoming. But like I had mm -hmm. all the accolades that, you know, would make you have high self-esteem. Yes. But self-worth is the understanding that I don't have to do anything. Like I don't have to perform. I don't have to produce. I don't have to be a good daughter. I don't, like I am just a child of God and I deserve a good life and good things just for that reason. Yeah. Like I can show up and like the world yeah. is good to me because I'm, because I woke up today. Like yeah. there's nothing that I have to do. Yeah. So self-worth was low, but my mm -hmm. self-esteem was high. And that can look crazy, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm sitting around here on my throne, like, oh my God, all you peasants, like, yes. mm -hmm, you better get your lives together. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm going home to a man who I can't even put on oh, certain outfits because he's like, you know, you're going to, like, it was crazy. Oh. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm reading the textbooks and I'm diagnosing and I'm going to, and that's another thing. Like, I love that I have a master's degree and I went to school. That's awesome. Those textbooks have nothing on my real life. Real experience. life, for like, sure. Like, so, <laughs> so I like, listen, like my life experience is what has me showing up on your podcast, having this conversation, not my book smarts. For sure. So I am, you know, diagnosing him and I'm trying to figure it out and I'm trying to help this man. I get pregnant. I get pregnant. And he, this man begged me to have a child. Like he, I had one daughter and he was like, I really want to have, he had one child before me. He's like, I really want to have a child with you. Like we, we, I, you know, we were going to be together forever. And he like begged me to have this baby. And again, I'm codependent. So I am going to cave on what I want and give you what you want, because I believe in my mind at this time that that's how you earn love. Like you have to sacrifice yourself in order to be loved. So, okay, let's have a baby. I have a baby. I get, pre well, I get pregnant. I'm six months pregnant. And this man starts to say, is it even my baby? Like, is that my baby? I don't even know if that's my baby. Like, and let me just give you some context. I have never cheated in a relationship. I am loyal to the soil. Like I was codependent. So like there was right. never, like I, I'm not a person right. who is going to cheat in a relationship. Same. So I'm six months pregnant. He's now saying things like, I don't even know if it's my baby. And I'm just like, what? Like, so I'm talking to God. Like I'm like, I, at one point I went to the doctor and I was like, do I have, can I get do I have to have the baby? Like, you know, and like, I'm, and the doctor's looking at me like, girl, I think we're a little far along to be having this conversation. So it was crazy. Seven months pregnant. I remember it was like a Sunday afternoon. I was laying on the bed. I was reading and he was mad about something. And he is like, so escalated that he is going to move. Like he's moving out of my place. So he's like, packing his stuff and he's like he's like aggressively like tearing things out the closet and he's packing up and I'm just like reading a book I'm I'm not really a person who matches energy and my skill set is in crisis so a lot of the work that I did with kids was um I would be called often to crisis to de-escalate a crisis so if a person is really escalated, my skill set is in being able to de-escalate the situation. Yeah. So I'm like not even giving this any attention. Like he's acting crazy and I'm just like calm. I'm very calm and I'm reading a book. I remember that. Well, I'm still, I'm not an educator yet. Like I'm just in the early phases of my like classroom. So I don't really know what you're supposed to do to de-escalate, but I do feel like if I get angry, that's not going to help the situation. So I'm laying on the bed and I'm reading this book. And he's mad and he's yelling and he's, you know, saying all these things and he's moving out. Because I'm not giving him a reaction and that's what he wants. He, that is what escalates him. So he hits me. And this, I had never been in a, like I'd never been hit by a man. So my instinct, because my daddy is from the street, he's, he's from Cleveland. So if you hit me, baby, my instinct, even at seven months 
months pregnant is to get up and square up. And I guess we're going to fight. Like, I, I don't really know. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm like squaring up to fight a man and I'm seven months pregnant and he's squaring up to fight with me. Like, you know? And so, mm -hmm. um, I think at some point, I don't know, like I must have an awareness that like Monica, like you're not even in a position to be able to fight a man right now. So I call for help. I call my girlfriend, my girlfriend who lives in the same area that we're in and is dating his best friend. They come out and they like his best friend is like, what are you doing? Like you can, you don't hit women. Like he's trying, you know, and they end up calling the police. He gets out of there before the police come. So this is my first experience with any kind of physical abuse. But I also want to emphasize that abuse is a lot of things. And there was a lot of abuse that was happening before it got physical but because, you know, of how we're conditioned, and I think Black and brown people especially are conditioned for violence to some degree. I mean, we came here in a very violent way. Yeah. So our bar, you know, you and I talked about um, moving my moving to Dallas and how, like, the perception of what a bad neighborhood in Dallas is so different than the perception of what it is in Cleveland. And that's how I kind of feel about Black and brown people and relational violence. Like, it's like our bar for what is violent or traumatic or what a trauma even is, is so low because we've been through so much trauma. Yeah. So a man hitting me, like, I don't know, I, that happens to girls, I guess is what I was thinking. So I, it didn't even occur to me. And I thought about it this morning in the aftermath of all of this, I'm seven months pregnant. I'm about to have a baby. This man is abusive. Now he's being physical at no point, Ebony, after this even, do I think I'm supposed to go get therapy? I'm supposed to maybe go like talk, like I like I ne it never occurs to me that I somehow need to be cared for in all of this. Mm -hmm. My whole focus was like, it, it was first it was caring for him and then it shifted from, you know, he, he needs help. Like he's a bad person. So he needs the therapy. He needs the help. Like, I don't need help. Like I, like I'm a victim. Like, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I just, my thinking was so distorted. Like, you know, I think about if I was seven months pregnant and got in a car accident, I would know I'm supposed to go lay down somewhere and rest. Like I'm supposed to like care for myself. Yeah. But in this situation, that was not my thought process. My thought process was you got to keep it pushing. You got to go to class on Monday. Like we don't have time for this. Like, so there was no like instinct to care for myself, even yeah. you know, as this was happening. So he leaves um, the relationship. I, I terminate the relationship. I have the most beautiful, healthy baby girl. And he, you know, after I have her, comes back around. Like, he's like, I want to be in my child's life. Like, I want to be with you. And so I let him come back. And I think he might have been there for maybe two months. And something happened where he got upset and had this angry outburst and he shattered a, a mirror. Like I had like this uh, cute antique, like full length mirror that, you know, I don't know, but he like shattered it. Like he broke, he was so angry that he broke it. And I remember my oldest daughter who had been in observation of a lot of this, you know, domestic abuse and violence, in the early part, she would go hide in her closet. Like she'd be so afraid because we were, I had not been in an experience like this. When this happened, I remember she got on my lap and she's like, mom, I want to go to Disney. And she was like talking about like Disney or something. And I, and I thought to myself in that moment, like, is she normalizing this? Like, is she, mm -hmm. like, she used to be afraid and like hide in a closet. And now she's like talking to me like normal. Like, so is, is she thinking like that this man getting upset and breaking things and punching things is a normal thing. And w for whatever reason, that was enough for me to be like, never again. Like, I can't, like, I don't want my children to think that this is what love looks like. Mm -hmm. So I broke up with that man and never looked back, never looked back, like never looked back. I have never been in another physically abusive relationship, but my bar for what abuse is, is low, right? My bar at that time for what abuse is, is somebody physically putting hands on you at seven months pregnant. Mm -hmm. I went on to go and be in a lot of relationships after that, 
that were still abusive. They just weren't physically abusive. Yeah. Yeah. And you spoke to so many things that I really could relate to um, as in, I think my story was almost backwards. Like I, I started out in the physically abusive relationship. So the relationships that followed after, I didn't recognize, right? The controlling of, well, you're doing this and uh, what I could wear or the derogatory marks of me, like putting on makeup and being a clown today. I mean, really just how people kind of create a sense of control because they, you know, this lack of self-worth. And you said something so important that I really want to touch on um, because I think as women who do perform, let's just use that word as identifying as high performance. That's what culture calls us, right? We're high performance women, straight A's, 4.0 GPA. I can go to the best college. I've written papers for people. Like I, I've done so many things to prove I can get an A. Like I could go to school for anything. I could go to yeah. school for anything and get a 4.0. That's just how my brain works, right? And you said something that touched my soul, which is the, the, different, the differentiation of high self-esteem and, and low self-worth, right? And I think sometimes as women, because we have worked so hard to perform, to find value in what we do, that we don't recognize. And I think I didn't recognize this. When I go back to 2019, leaving the relationship I was in, I didn't realize, I mean, until after, and I had to really ask myself, why did you stay for so long? Like you talk about the red flags. I mean, it's like someone standing there with the red flag. <laughs> like, like, whoop, like, girl, when are you going to see this? Um, because I think that what felt, what I noticed for me was the shame. Yeah. Like, how could you be so fucking smart? And these are things that you'll even hear from these people. You're yeah. so smart, but you can't da 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 da, right? Yeah. Oh, you're yeah. so smart. You know, you work with people, but you're dumb and you're this, right? So I, I, mean, I was in a program to become a counselor. Yeah. It's so important for us to say that out loud because we were the top of the top. We were the smart. Like, if anybody yeah. should know what is even more crazy. At that time, I was interning at a domestic abuse shelter. Wow. I was literally working with women who were being abused. And I was in my ego, like, I don't know what's wrong with these women, but that ain't. And I'm going home to a man yeah. who is trying to control my every move because he also is abusive. But because, you know, I'm so stuck in my ego, I see myself as separate from these other women. And and I'm smarter. Like, I'm in college. Like, I, so I'm, I put myself... You know, I used all of my self-esteem to put myself at a separate place than these other women to the degree that I couldn't even see that I am these women. Yeah. Like, I'm the same as these women. Yeah. You no? Know? Yeah, it is. It is a crazy thing. It is a crazy thing. So you were like just piecing together things. And even in my mind and some of the things I volunteered to do um, and how I, I, I absolutely did that. I absolutely did that on a lot of levels where I was extremely judgmental. And you think, no, not me. And again, I think, you know, you go back to those memories and the things that we do, like we can bury a lot to cope. Yes. You know, we can bury so much just to kind of make it through that when you kind of wake up, I feel like I just had this moment sitting. I remember just sitting on a couch, looking at him. And in that moment, I didn't know what who my life, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know why I was there. I didn't like our couch, we would put a sheet on it because uh, the the fabric on it started to tear. So underneath it, like it was tearing and pulling up. And I just remember looking around my house like, this is not who I am. If I don't know who I am, maybe I don't know who I am. And I thought I did because I was already coaching. And that was the ego that came in too. Like, how are you helping women? And you're that ego of like, how could you, how could you be faulty? And you're so perfect to everyone else. Right. And I've always been authentic, but I think that was one of the experiences that I had to really work through because we can find ourselves in those spaces where, um, we internalize the shame. And I'm happy that, you know, I, if I'm, if I'm, if we're speaking to anyone, you know, I think if there's one thing we have to stop doing is internalizing it and find a way to get it out, you know, find a way to, uh, therapeutically, you know, find an outlet to really just grow and heal through it and not blame yourself, shame yourself through the experience because that doesn't help. But you really said so much that I was like, dang, you know, I was really in this space that, 
Yeah, I didn't I didn't see it either. You know, I didn't see it either. And even now at this stage in life, having to reckon that and having to really acknowledge all the things that I accepted for so long that mm -hmm. I didn't see an issue with, and then having to co-parent. Yeah. Right. And then how certain things may still show up and how you know what I mean? Like you know yeah. what I mean? So uh, that's like a whole nother podcast. It, sure. It's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Because that, you know, uh, because watching my daughters try to navigate a world when I have to accept that their childhood was also yeah. not healthy. Like, you know what I'm saying? So like there's, there's, um, there's a, a, an, you know, I give myself grace, but there's also still like a feeling of like, damn, like mm -hmm. I wish I would have had the self-worth to pour yeah. into them, you know, because now it feels like I'm yeah. watching patterns repeat Yeah. to a degree. Like I still am so optimistic and hopeful. Like I have grandchildren now, like I, like at, my children are so much further ahead than I was at their age because yeah. I was further ahead than my mom was. So I see the light, but it also feels like, damn, like I wish I would have had more to offer them in terms of self-worth so that they wouldn't mm -hmm. have to, because it's difficult to watch patterns repeat. Oh. And, you know, I could get in my ego with that too. Like, oh my God, like, what are you girls doing? Like, you're, you're smarter than this. You're better than this. Why don't you know more than this? But you know what? Why didn't I know more than that? Like, yeah. you know, so like, I think, one of my favorite quotes is we can only meet people as deeply as we meet ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so that to me is, you know, also ties back to going back into figuring out who you were and your childhood trauma and all these things, because I think that the times in my life where I was most judgmental were the times when really I was using that judgment as a way to not have to connect with somebody's experience. Because if I had to connect yes. with your experience, then I was going to have to get real about my experience. Yes. And the reason why I'm being triggered to even show up in this judgmental way is because there's something in your experience that is too closely related to mine. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm denying it and you're like showing it. And like, I don't, we cover that up. Like we don't show that in public. Like, so yeah. I realized like when I would show up in these spaces and be so judgmental, even with my daughters, it was more so about me trying to protect myself from having to connect with an experience that I also have had. Yeah. And I'm just trying to make myself feel like, no, we, we're done with that. Like we're better than that. Mm -hmm. Like we, but it, the truth is I wouldn't be called to feeling like I have to do that if I really was good with this experience, you know? So yeah. Yeah. 100 percent so much. And I will say that once you make the commitment to start to heal yourself, you really just don't have an interest in carrying the weight of healing other people. Like, yeah. you know, like my focus of even now as a um, as a coach or a consultant, when I do this work, I am not um, in any way trying to bring people to my point of view or drag people to my understanding, or like, if I have to drag or pull, I, that feels like resistance, that feels like unaligned, mm -hmm. that feels like you're probably just maybe we're not in the same yeah. place on the journey. So I don't want to do that. Like, all I can do is show up and be my most authentic self and tell you like, this is what I did. This is my journey. And then if that speaks to you in some kind of way, you have questions, you're curious, I can help answer them. But I'm not in a place anymore where I'm going to try to convince somebody that my way is the right way mm. because I think there's a million ways to do it. Yeah. And I think that the times when I didn't know what I was doing also are the times that led me to this space where I feel like I do know what I'm doing a little bit yeah. better. Like, you know what I mean? So I really had shame was such a huge part of my, of my conditioning, my life, my mom punishes through shame. Like that's, that was such a part of my childhood was just all this shame. And, sh and I think as a woman, like you're just, there's shame. Everything is shame. Like you, yeah. you start to develop boobs and oh my God, you got to cover that up. You get your period. Like, oh my God, that's dirty. Like there's right. so much shame. Like I, I remember having an epiphany a couple years ago about losing my virginity. And I was 14 and a half when I lost my virginity. And again, I told you, I met that guy the summer before high school and we were together for all four years of high school. 
in my mind, like this was my first love. This was the most loving, beautiful relationship. Girl, I went to therapy and she was like, that shit wasn't healthy either. Like, so like, I'm like, what? Like my whole childhood is like messed up. Like, so, but I remember um, when I lost my virginity, there's, there was a lot of like, you're fast or like, you know, like th there's this like shaming and I didn't feel it in my friend group, but obviously like the adults and people around you are like, you shouldn't be doing that. Like, so there's all this shame and I carried that shame for so long because then I also got pregnant. I was not married. And these were things that my mom valued. Like you have to be married. You have to like, so I was like, there was so much shame and sh just shame and shame and shame. And so I finally had this epiphany a couple of years ago, uh, just about my sexuality in terms of like, Literally, my body is biologically telling me to procreate as soon as I get my period. So, oh. like, I got my period, I was in sixth grade. So, mm -hmm. like, my body is hormonally saying, just like if you if you have pets and your cat or dog is in heat, like, my body is oh. saying, like, let's go hump some stuff. Yeah. And I am being told <laughs> that that is wrong and you should right. be ashamed of yourself and you're a whore and, like, what is right. wrong with but it's like, I like, this is my body. Like what? Do you, so right. I think that, you know, in hindsight, even with my own children and now what I can do with my grandchildren is say, oh my God, like your body is like going to want to hump things. Like, like that's a normal way to feel. And what you might want to do is try to regulate it so that you don't get yourself in situations where you don't feel good about the choices you made. Like yeah. that's what this is about. Like this isn't yeah. about like, you know, I'm trying to go you know, sleep around with a whole bunch of men because there's something in my spirit that I'm just a loose woman, which is what I think society makes you think, but that's not what's happening, you know? So yeah, Ebony, I could talk forever, yeah. like forever. <laughs> <laughs> I love this so much. We do have probably about five more minutes. Um, I just want to affirm and amen and ashe everything that you've just said, you know, and I think when, when we talk about even the journey you've shared today, you know, um, a lot of us in society don't realize you have multi levels of conditioning. So you have your family, you have uh, family, friends, church, school, uh, you, do have, you have so many levels to sift through um, that I think sometimes we can't even see that we're doing that, right? We're not supporting the natural journey of life. We're not supporting um like, how do we have these conversations with young people that also affirms their experience? Because if you deny the experience and you say, what you're feeling is wrong, what you're feeling is bad, that's the devil, especially in the Black community, right? That yeah. is the devil, girl. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You basically make a part of what's happening for that person uh, bad. And, and a lot of times, especially at that age, because we don't have that thinking capacity yet, we want to try it out. We actually want to be like, okay, well, they're saying this is bad. You know, it's kind of like drinking at a young age, right? You're like, there's oh, everyone saying funny. this is bad. <laughs> Girl, I am a 40 year old woman and I still am impacted by if you tell me I'm not supposed to do something, I want to do, like, do it. I'm going to do it. I want to do it. So like, I mean, right. Like, it's what it is. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, my, I know we're wrapping up. So I would, if I could tell anybody anything about starting a healing journey, I would say, um, just become curious, like just start to become curious about like who you are, like, mm -hmm. you know, start to ask yourself those questions. Like there's no right or wrong way to do it. But my journey started when I started to ask myself specifically about relationships. Like, why am I always in a relationship with a man who doesn't treat me well? Like who isn't kind to me? Like, why is that? Like it, it shifted from all the men are bad and all the men are shitty to no, why am I choosing this type of man? Like, you know, and that's a very different question because that question then is like not focused on what's happening externally, but what is happening internally that is making me drawn to this type of person. And what I will say is one of the things that helped get rid of the shame was my understanding that a lot of that drive comes from conditioning that I was just suppressing and not even aware was happening. And when you say layers of conditioning, we're talking about conditioning as a woman, we're talking about conditioning as a 
black person. We're talking about conditioning from slavery. Like I did EMDR therapy and there were things that came up in those sessions that are not even my trauma. It's my my grandma's trauma from when she had to be a slave. Like that part. It's so nuanced and crazy. Yeah. And so you, I would say like, just get, lose the shame and just become curious. Like yeah. if you could just become curious about who you are, who your parents were, who they, who their parents were. Mm -hmm. Like it helps to answer a lot of your questions. Yeah. And as you start to go on that quest, I don't know, you start to learn to like yourself. Like you start to be like, oh, because you're not lying to yourself anymore. You know, so like now I'm at a place where I am very clear about what I'm good at and I'm very clear about what I struggle with. Yeah. And I don't care. Like, I don't care. Like, you know, like it's like, all of me is worthy. Like yeah. all of me on my best day, on my worst day, like I am a gift to this world. Like that is very clear to me. Like, so yeah, like that, I, but that has taken a lot of work <laughs> to yeah. get to that place. Yeah. Well, honestly, we thank you for doing that work because no matter the age and age is absolutely um, to Aaliyah's point, it really is a number. You know, it is a number. And I think we have to deprogram even that where we, I think sometimes certain people do get to an age where they feel like I'm just going to turn the switch off and I'm yeah. going to stop working towards like, I'm too old for this, or I'm too old yeah. to pursue that, you know? And it's like, you, you, re as long as you're breathing, you have a choice. As long as you're breathing, you have options. And I think a lot of people minimally, minimally beyond the money and all the things that we, the, the, the glittery things, we deeply want to know ourselves because when you know yourself, I literally just said this this morning, like literally this is an, this is the Instagram post for the day, which is, when you know, love, and like yourself, like nothing in this world can, can sway you, right? Because there are things people will say, there are things people will do, there are even things our kids will do, yeah. right? That can really take us out of our element and, and take us back, you know, to the childhood, to the shame, to the, to, to the guilt, to all those emotions, opposed to being like, I really know myself. I know the heart of who I am. I know the intentions of why I do things. Um, you know, I I've owned up to the to the sh the shitty things, right? I've owned up to the bad choices. I've owned up to the mistakes, and, and I'm good. And understanding that the bad choices, the shitty things, the mistakes are also just a part of a conditioning that told you you were supposed to be doing. Like you, you know what I'm saying? Like none of it is. Like nobody wakes up in the morning is like, I'm going to make my life miserable and make other people's <laughs> lives miserable. Like you don't do that. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of it is just so unconscious, you know, mm -hmm. what we're doing. So yeah, get yeah. curious. And my other thing is that I live by now, Ebony, is follow the joy. Like I don't oh. do things that don't feel yeah. joyful. Like it, yeah. like it, it needs to eat. And it doesn't mean that I don't do hard things because I am still committed to my healing. And so a lot of the things that I have to do, I just recently had an epiphany that I, there is a block in meeting my life partner because I still have mother wound work to do. Mm -hmm. Like I, like I think I've done six years of healing and I did EMDR and I did all this hard work and like I've arrived, like I got good self-esteem and self-worth now. So I'm done. I'm done. Like I deserve like, a good, you know, like, <laughs> and I do do all of that, but I am now understanding that I personally am, I am having a block because there is still some other wound stuff that I need to work through. I need to really lean into forgiving my mom, you know, and like really accepting my mom for who she is. And like, so there's so much to this. So I, the journey never ends. I never will feel like I'm done, but it is that curiosity and that following the joy that keeps me youthful that keeps me like optimistic that keeps me like oh my god and and it and, it, and I've made it where the journey is now fun yeah. because again like I don't do a lot of things that I, I really don't do anything that I don't want to do and I have better boundaries so I say no a lot you know I remember you you asked me about you wanted to do this podcast at like 10 a.m or something or 9 a.m and I was like girl I don't even get up till like I can't I'm not doing that like because because yeah. then I'll get up and I'll try to be what you need me to be and it won't it won't be like this you yeah. know what I'm saying so instead like let me just let me propose 
that I'm going to show up in the way that I show up so that I can be most effective yeah. for what you're asking me to do. Like, that's what makes more sense to me now. Like, so yeah, follow the joy, get curious and say no, say yeah. no to yeah. stuff that you want to do. Oh, this has been so good. I know that I could absolutely talk to you forever. And I know and I can come back or you can come on my podcast. Yes. Yes, I love Let's this. Let's do it. Let's absolutely do it. I do think we need a part two to kind of just tackle some other things that I know people are going to probably want to dive into. And if you're listening to this, leave a comment, especially on the YouTube video on Spotify. You can also leave a comment. Let me know what's sticking out for you the most. Let me know what's resonating the most and topics that are really lighting up for you because this is, we've touched on so many different things and it's really like, I've thought of so many people I've had conversations with and I'm like, they're going to love this because- uh -oh. Um, you know, it's, it's, we are all looking for glimmers of light, you know, cause even in what, what we decide to put out into the world. And this is why you have to know your, your worth and, and love yourself because sometimes we can feel, I thought about this yesterday. I said, some people are actually so jealous of you because you're so flawed, but you still are so fucking authentically you. And they don't understand, you know, like we just have this idea that one day you'll arrive and one day, you know, you'll have it all together and it'll all make sense. And it's like, I learned from a few people, one of those being Maya Angelou, when she had her last, very last interview. And she said, she basically said, I still like, I'm, I feel like I'm still becoming. And then Ayala Van Zant, she was on the show. She, she was doing all this work for years with Oprah and her shows. And she talked about how she had separated from a guy she was with for 16 years. But did that stop her from being Ayala? Did, did that stop her from having a show? Having yeah. a show that said, fix my life. Yeah. Right? So yeah. it's important that we understand the duality of healing and growth. And we don't allow yeah. ourselves to be handicapped yeah. by the imperfections, quote unquote, that show up in just everyday life. And I feel like what you really hit home today, at least for me, and I hope the audience heard that as well, is that... Like the journey is the journey, right? And it's not about, you know, the way we've been structured and like get those A's and in and, and the perfection of like, uh, you know, having an A or a B and if, you know, and feeling like life might be an F, right? Um, but to really uh, build our self-worth so that we understand that like the journey is the journey, right? But what we, what we, sh what we should not do, and I don't use the word should not because it's a prison, but I think the worst thing we do to ourselves is we don't develop the boundaries. We don't discover who we are. We don't ask questions. We don't deep dive into that childhood because we're too afraid to revisit. Um, and I think that just really handicaps people and not really being able to explore. Like some people don't even know what joy means. And you know what, Ebony, I've learned to reframe even that because in those earlier phases when I was not capable of tapping into my joy or following my joy, when I was in survival, that's what I tell people. Yeah. Like it's very difficult to care for yourself when you're in survival mode. So I look at that very differently too. Like, because there was a lot of time where I was unknowing and I was not doing this journey the way I'm doing it now. Yeah. But in the unknowing got me to the knowing. Yeah. So like, also, like if you're whatever, wherever you are on this journey right now, there is no shame. I, there is no judgment. Like just, you know, like, yeah, like I, I think that's important to say. Like I, I don't want to, I am now in a place where I don't want anybody to feel like, mm -hmm. And this is a newer feeling, like where I've arrived somewhere and now I'm better. You know what I'm saying? Than somebody else. Because I also was you at one time. And if I was you at one time and now I'm this me, anybody can take this walk. Like, you know what I'm saying? And it yeah. so there's no, yeah. Like, I think there were times in my life where ignorance saved my life. Like, I could not tap into my childhood wounds because I had two kids that I had to feed and I didn't have any help. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? So like, I don't even regret or shame myself for the times where I couldn't go to therapy, like, yeah. or I didn't have the capacity to work on myself because that was also serving to keep me alive at the time. Yeah. So I give grace to that part of my journey too, you know? Man. Oh, this is so good. So listen, let us know where can we find you? Um, where can we follow up with you? Yeah, so I my biggest platform is my Instagram. I am at the First Mind Company on Instagram. So it's T H E F I R S T M I N D C O um on Instagram. You can find me. And then that is also the name of my podcast. If you're interested in checking out the first season, 
Um, my podcast is really just this dialogue that we just had. It's all about like the journey of healing. Um, my therapist has come and spoken on my podcast. I've tried to like pull different people from all kinds of modalities of healing on that podcast, just so that, you know, we can see that there's so many ways to do this work. You don't have to just be locked into one kind of way. Um, but yeah, my podcast, my Instagram, you um, can email me at mwallacewellness at gmail if you're interested in working with me. Um, yeah, that's that's Beautiful. it. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being here. Listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, as much as sometimes we don't think, um, this is actually a part of the healing journey, right? This is the part this is the part that helps to kind of move, you know, the stepping stones that help us move along by listening to other people's stories and finding some solidarity so that we can, we take what we need and we leave what we don't. So thank you so yeah. much for tuning in again, leave those comments. So I know what you're resonating with, what you want to hear more of. And thank you so much for tuning into soul chat. This has been an amazing episode.